Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 792. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 7th, 2023. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We are glad you could be here. We do ask a few things of our audience before we get too far started. You know, first, come out here, open mind. Hey, this is two guys. They're kind of old. They probably don't know what they're talking about, but I'll certainly listen to them. Or you already watched the program before. I know these guys are pretty funny. They're witted, and they do know what they're talking about. Or you think we're not funny, and we do know what we're talking about. Yeah, there's a whole gamut of people out there. Just enjoy. Have an open mind. And... If you have an open mind, you'd love to, to like the program. If you see us on Facebook or YouTube, click the like button. That's free promotion and free advertising for us. If you are so desirous of giving us your, your opinion or your ideas, go to the comment section on YouTube and add them. That has been a very vibrant place the last three or four weeks with all that's been going on with the uh, Asbury Revival and the Church of England and politics around the world. It's nice to hear your opinions. Some of you have corrected our inaccuracies and you're more than welcome to do that. Just don't call us dumb in the comments. That's, that's not very helpful. And finally, if you so desire, please share this episode with your family, friends, neighbors, even your enemies deserve to watch Anglican unscripted. George, how are you doing this week? Pretty good. We had something exciting happening on Saturday night. We have a 5 p.m. Saturday service, and there were two newcomers in the congregation named Peter and Donna. And I was chatting with them, and they're from Foxborough, Massachusetts. And mm -hmm. they're tourists on vacation who watch Anglican Unscripted faithfully and on their way, on their okay. drive back to Massachusetts, <laughs> timed their drive trip so they could stop in for services at Shepherd of the Hills. Right, and wow. their comment was, you're much taller than we thought. We thought <laughs> Kevin was the tall one. <laughs> well, do, I don't know how that happens, George. That's kind of weird. <laughs> no, yes, you are much. Yeah, I mean, there people have seen pictures on Facebook uh, of both of us. And George, you're like 7'6", and I'm like 5'1". And so there is there is quite a, a difference between the two of us. Um, in fact, if you guys want to be Facebook friends with us, I'm putting the links right below uh, for my Facebook account to George's. And we would love to uh, be friends with the viewers of the show. We also have Facebook pages, Anglican Unscripted, Anglican TV, and Anglican.inc. You should sign up for as well to get updates about what's happening in the Anglican world, George. And also, I would mention uh, that, that the couple stayed after the service with the mm -hmm. deacon, um, uh, my deacon, uh, Kathy, and they asked that we pray for them. One of them was having some medical issues, uh, and we prayed for about 10 or so minutes. And if you feel, I believe in the power of prayer. Uh, it's something I like to do, something it's important to me. And I don't want to pray for people publicly over the Facebook or Internet, but if you want to privately contact either Kevin or myself to ask a question or ask for prayer or something, please do so. I mean, this is not just, uh, this is not just news and information. This is community. I hope that you feel that you're part of a community that's more than just picking on Justin Welby. And, yeah, jeez. It's much. One percent of my week is talking about Justin Welby. The the rest is uh, being part of the Christian community. But not just would are we willing to pray for you. We're also willing to help point you in the direction uh, to. Uh, hey, I went to the Asbury revival. I'm revived again. I've repented. What do I do now? Ke call Kevin. I'll help you out. You know, and we'll get you started on daily office. We'll get you started. You know, going through something that will keep you reconnected and not backslide again. Um, if you are a person who just has certain concerns or you need something, uh, more of the uh, deliverance type ministries, I can point you in the right direction. Uh, so can George. This is not just a news program. We are people who are uh, Christian who also happen to have an opinion and uh, conduct that over Anglican Unscripted. Um, how's your, other than that, how's your week going, George? Pretty good. Susan came yeah. returned from Philadelphia. She had flown up to be with her mother who had had a stroke mm -hmm. uh and 
there's some frontal temporal lobe damage up here in her mother. And I was quite excited because now I have a piece of paper that formally states my mother-in-law's crazy. I thought this for about 40 years. You knew already. But I have it in <laughs> writing today. Uh, and so Susan will be, we're moving, uh, we're moving her into uh, uh, not an assisted living, but the step up from that. Sure. Uh, yeah. There's. Um, where she'll have some, she'll have community meals. She'll have someone mm. giving her pills. Uh, moving from a two-bedroom apartment in this facility to a suite. Uh, what, what, no, what's, what's the word? Not a suite. Uh, studio. 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 Yep. And that means I'm going to have to fly up and uh, move the furniture and mm -hmm. decide. You know, she'll tell me, "Oh, give that to your cousin Fred and Bill and this and that," and sort of disposing of antiques and. And Kevin, just what I need in my house are more pieces of New England furniture that do not look good in Florida. Because <laughs> we well, can't sell this stuff until people die. Well, I shouldn't say that, but uh, well, no, there you go. Yeah, my dad died right around Christmas time, and now I'm getting weird emails from mom who's downsizing. Who wants this? Who wants this? Who wants this? It's going to Goodwill if you don't want it. And she's getting very few takers, but uh, I think uh, um, Victoria's going to take a... Uh, uh, U-Haul out there sometime and, and collect the stuff she wants to keep of the memorabilia of it. My mom is also downsizing and going to a higher care facility uh, as well soon. So, uh, crazy well, times. There's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. For instance, uh, the silverware. Not not silver, silver, but you know the kitchenware, spatulas, knives, forks, spoons, things that uh, you accumulate over a lifetime, but you really don't want to shell out when you're in your twenties. Uh, for a completely stocked kitchen. So that kitchen is all being shipped out to Seattle and uh, some bed linens and towels are all going to San Francisco. So mm -hmm. it's all going to get there. It's just the heavy stuff that I've got to move that I've got to figure out what to do with. Okay. Uh, also, keep Kevin and the Coulson family in your prayers. Uh, I have two daughters, and so I should need to say any more that we're having a little drama in our family, and uh, it's causing uh, big consternation. And it's something that it's more than I can handle, but it's not something more than the God I worship can handle. And so, yes, we'll get through it. But boy, I could certainly use your prayers uh, just for strength and, and mostly wisdom. How to how to come off as the wise father in this, you know? I Kind of like a 50s TV father, you know? Well, you know, so I mean, I would really like to be able to do that here. So please keep me and Jill in your prayers as we uh, attend through this for the next couple of weeks. Um, we, we were gobs back this week, but... Yeah, that's part of life in 2023. George, let's move on to the news. Um, oh, sorry. I had an image pop up on my browser of a story we're going to talk about in the middle of our show, and it was pretty gross. Um, let's get off to Pakistan. Um, that's kind of heating up. And this is going to show the dynamics of the lack of authority now of the Church of England in the world. Um Church of England is a has-been. It used to be a glorified leader in the Anglican Communion, a church that was sought out for a council. The Archbishop of Canterbury was a, a de facto place you would go if you need a, a political favor done in, in helps for your church and your country. Well, those days are going to be clearly over, yet I just saw Pakistan say, we're having trouble here, the Lahore Diocese is going all wacko, Archbishop of Canterbury, can you help us? Yeah, the Lahore Diocese, which is the wealthiest, largest diocese in the Church of Pakistan, uh, elected a bishop without going through the national church canonical processes. And this has led to angry exchange of words, lawsuits, and breaking into factions. And recently a court uh, enjoined the newly elected Bishop of Lahore from spending any money. And they'll probably get that stayed, but it's just the typical church stuff. Well, the National Church of Pakistan has reached out to Justin Welby to mediate this dispute, to find a way forward. Now, George Carey, excuse me, 20 odd years ago did this, actually in the same diocese when there was a dispute. And Carey was able to bring so all the parties together, knock some sense into them, and get things to come together again. And George Carey did this in Rwanda after the genocide, essentially saying, you, 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 you got to go. You can stay because you were on the side of the angels. Um, 
it doesn't look like Justin Welby can or will do anything because he's sworn off uh, getting involved in these things. And so it's been handed to the ACC Secretary General, who's a bit clueless because he really can't do anything. And so I expect what will happen is that the primates, if asked, will start step into this mess. Now, they'll only move if the uh, primate of Pakistan, the moderator, Azad Marshall, asks them to. But we're seeing a shift, as Kevin mentioned, from just, well, let, let, uh, let Canterbury, you know, work this, work this mess out to Canterbury's incompetent, Canterbury's incapable, Canterbury said they don't want to do it. So where is this problem going to fall in the great Anglican scheme of things? We'll yeah, see in the weeks to come. We, we will, I can imagine 15 years ago, a phone call from Rowan Williams, or just his office at the time, would have got the ball rolling one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, certainly Rowan would be you know, able to call um, some uh, brother, sister diocese of, of this, and, and we'll get it taken care of. That's not going to happen anymore. Uh, no. This may or may not split Pakistan uh, in the very near future. Ah, uh, what else is on the list here? Oh, we've talked about the millionaire bishop before. Um, basically, there's a bishop. What country is he from, George? Malawi, the diocese Malawi of bishop. Yeah, who um, wasn't doing a good job, basically got fired, but said, got a contract. And he took that contract to court, and the court said, it's good. You get your million dollars. The uh, Brighton Malasa is a bishop in his late 40s of Upper Shire, which is in the Republic of Malawi. And Brighton Malasa was excommunicated and deprived of office by the primate um, after a long, bitter fight with the clergy in his diocese where accusations of misconduct were leveled against uh, Bishop Malasa. Well, they didn't go through the whole canonical process of removing him by trial they just found a shortcut where he did something that enabled the archbishop to excommunicate him. Well, being Anglicans, they sued. And the employment tribunal said to the Church of South Church of the Province of Central Africa, look, this man has a contract. It says he must be paid until he's 65. He's 47 or something. And it works out that you can either pay him all that he's due, which is over a million bucks, or you keep paying him a salary for not doing anything for the next 15 years or so, 17 years. Which, of course, Upper Shire, which is dirt poor, Malawi is one of the poorer countries in Africa, can't afford a bishop to pay somebody like that. And there's nothing for him to do, even if he stayed, because all the clergy are loyal to the province, not to the bishop. Maybe one or two here and there, but... Sure, yeah. So it's... Uh, well, what's the old son, Sinatra song? Nice work, you can get it. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? And if you can get well, it, I, won't I, you tell me how? I don't know if the more to be a bishop without yeah. having to do any work. Can a diocese go for bankruptcy and uh, and get rid of this contract that way? I, I don't know about the laws over there. You know, certainly I'd, here in America, that would be tried. Oh, <sighs> but oh, it's goodness! It just we're in an era. For taking this issue into a broader picture, we're in an era of particularly bad bishops. Mm -hmm. you know, we've talked repeatedly about corruption in Pakistan, corruption in India, corruption in Africa, corruption in all these different places, in Mexico, in South America, and even in the United States. And it all comes down to bad bishops, people who do not exercise the charism of episcopacy. Now, whether they're outright crooks, like we have in some places in India, or whether they're cowed company men who just follow the orders like they do in the Church of England and who have no godliness or holiness, not all, but a good number uh, of them are just drones. Can I just say up front, this is not a transition into our next story about Frank Griswold. Okay, <laughs> I just... I want to. I want to just separate what we said about the the bishops in in other countries before we get to Frank Roosevelt, who may or may not fit that description. But it's not fair if we were to talk about him in, in his death to to quite attach. What <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to go for a transition there. No. Uh, oh, on to other news. Frank Griswold um, has passed away at 85 years of age. Now I met Frank Griswold. Uh, 
I don't want to go back how, a long time ago. The first time I met him was at uh, um, Bishop Love's Consecration. Uh, I think it was in Albany. And I had gone up there to videotape it. This is the early, early days of Anglican TV. And shook Frank's hand. And uh, Frank and a bunch of uh, bishops were there in full regalia. And Bob Duncan, who, you know, I was kind of new to this, but he came over and said hi, uh, was going to be part of the procession. And he made me sure that I knew that he's not dressing up in the processional. He'll take care of the laying on hands because we are currently in a broken communion in the Episcopal Church. And I was just trying to get on, you know, understand that this is early Kevin in the Episcopal Church. I said, okay, okay. And so, thus conducted a wonderful consecration, beautifully, well filmed, by the way, beautifully uh, conducted. And, uh, and then I saw that there is a split at the high levels within the Episcopal Church that they're willing to sacrifice things for. Bishop Duncan was willing to sacrifice being in his cloaks, uh, full clericals, uh, to show that there is a break in the fabric with just within the Episcopal Church. And that was my introduction to fully dressed up Frank Griswold. And then people started to help identify that he was what we call a liberal Catholic. Yes. Would that be a good description? Tell me your memories of Frank. Well, I've known Frank Griswold a little longer than that. He... Uh baptized my one of my younger brothers in 1965 I think he was the curate at the Church of the Redeemer in Bryn Mawr PA when uh, we were moved there when I was very very young and he was a contemporary of both my parents growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia so they knew him and they were never friends in fact they my father cordially disliked him he thought he was a bit as my father would say light in the loafers this is going back to the 1950s expression. And so Frank Griswold was always there in the 80s, he became Bishop of Chicago, uh, then he became presiding bishop in 97, I think it was, 97 or 98. And Frank Griswold, it, it's difficult to speak ill of the dead um, because he had many great qualities. He really was a very kind man. He was a very pastoral man. Mm -hmm. People did love him and the way that a good priest is loved. But at the same time, he had some failings and faults, and I don't want to you know, focus on particular party issues, but his strengths were in one area and his weaknesses were in another, and they became very apparent when he became primate of the Episcopal Church. For instance, he went to the London primates meeting in 2003 after Gene Robinson was elected Bishop of New Hampshire. And after the general convention approved his election and he was taken aside by the primates in this meeting. And that's the first time they had broken fellowship where the Nigerian Peter Akinola would not worship with Frank Griswold. Um, and Frank Griswold said, I won't go through, I won't lay hands on him of uh, Gene Robinson. Well, Frank returned back to the United States and under severe pressure caved in and laid hands on uh, Gene Robinson. And it was like one of the cases, and again, I'm reading mine, so this is not probably a good way to say this, but he knew the good, but he could be pressured to go along to get along. In other words, Frank would always vote with the majority in whichever room he was in, if it was at, so at the primates meetings, he wouldn't go there into the gay stuff, but back in the Episcopal House of Bishops, he would. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I've heard the same, I, but I heard just recently he was at a, a House of Bishops or a, a general convention, and he was speaking, and he was taking the conservative side of something, but nobody cared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think this was Indianapolis, I think it was, because I remember seeing Griswold and Catherine Jefferts Shorey and uh, Michael Curry up on a podium, and I forget what the issue was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was but something to do with human sexuality, I do remember. And Frank Griswold was essentially saying, we really can't go this far. We really can't alienate our Anglican communion partners. We need to have a good theological rationale before we do this, and we haven't reached that point. And as you said, so, said Kevin, nobody paid any attention. Now, unfortunately, 
so what I guess I'm thinking is Frank Griswold is a normal man with faults and strengths. And he made mistakes. He had some great successes. Under Frank Griswold, believe it or not, the Episcopal Church did not collapse. Its collapse began with Catherine Jefford Shorey. Whereas in the, during Griswold's time, the church, you know, gained a few, lost a few, but it remained stable. Whereas the Lutherans and the Presbyterians, that's when they began their decline. When Frank well, left, and in the and when Frank left, and we got Catherine Jefford Shorey in, because people like Fitzsimmons Allisons and the others could meet and talk with Frank and not feel that they were they had to watch their back because they would get knifed once they turned around. But when Frank was replaced by an ideologue who was a take no prisoner sort of person, and she didn't take a prisoner of Bob Duncan, she murdered Bob Duncan in church terms. And Keith well, Ackerman and Jack Eicher and all these people. And depose them. But, and that's the point. Frank, for all his faults, was not an enemy to the conservatives or the orthodox. Um, he just didn't have the ability as a leader to get that ball rolling or pr defend what he believed in. Yeah, so, again, you know, God will judge his souls. Uh, and he did many good things. He had his very strong points, and then he had his weak points, just as we all do. <laughs> Both George and I have our strengths and our weaknesses. All right, so let's move on to the news. Uh, more follow-up to the uh, Church of England's meeting a couple weeks ago, where they uh, set forth the uh, direction and journey for the LLF. And it looks like um, Jerusalem, Congo, South Africa are all saying no to gay blessings, George. Yeah, we after the after the vote, we had that first flurry of statements and videos from Uganda, Nigeria, Rwanda, Kenya. Now we're saying more statements. Some of them are not a surprise. Congo is a member of the GAFCON movement, but they saying that this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. No surprise there. Um, Jerusalem is a bit of a surprise. Jerusalem is heavily reliant upon the Episcopal Church for its financial existence. We send, we, the Episcopal Church, send a great deal of money. Every Easter, uh, we collect money for the church in Jerusalem, which is the Diocese of Jerusalem, which is its mm -hmm. archbishop and its, its work. And <clears throat> they put out a statement saying, while we remain in communion with the Church of England, this, what they have done, is absolutely unchristian, untenable, and we urge them to repent. Wow. Wow. So wow. they... But that because of their location and being in the middle of the Middle East, that is probably the very least they could say to uh, protect themselves. Yeah, and you know, when you're surrounded by Hamas on one side and uh, Fatah on the other and the Israelis on a third, so you've got three enemies around you in your mind, you have to be careful with your words. But they did say something. And that was quite a statement that they did say something. The South African story is actually the more interesting one to my mind. The Theological Commission of the South African College of Bishops, led by Bishop Raphael Hess of Saldhana Bay, which is just to the wet, uh, wet east of Cape Town on the southern coast, put together a recommendation after a study period saying the church should, should bless same-sex civil partnerships. We're not going to marry people in church, but we should bless those partnerships. And they asked the College of Bishops to do this, adopt this. Now, this uh, study was started nine years ago, so they worked on it a very long time, and it was led by, if you will, the liberal Catholic wing of the South African Church. And the primate, Tabo Makoba, has been outspoken in favor of blessing same-sex civil unions. He won't go all the way to marriage, but he will bless same-sex civil unions. So he's Episcopal Church circa 2006 on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the trajectory, on the gay trajectory. Well, the House of Bishops turned them down. And it said that while we empathize with, and while we say that gays and lesbians are full members of the church, and we love them, and but we cannot uh, 
move we cannot have the church swing with the swing in the wind according to any whim of society it must be faithful to the scriptures and to the traditions it was received so this was a major blow and slowly uh, this was a closed meeting and what we saw was the liberal white bishops along with the liberal catholic african bishops voting for it and then we saw the white evangelicals and the what i would say more africa afrocentric bishops voting uh, against it so they have a woman bishop in swaziland they have a woman bishop in uh, lesotho and they have some women bishops they all voted for it because they're part of that more liberal wing and at the lambeth conference last summer you saw justin welby bring them up to give sermons and speeches and whatnot to sort of show that we're in solidarity with african women well the bishop of natal and the bishop of grahamstown and places like that said no 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 we're not going that far we are we are not going to overthrow the bible just because it's the latest greatest thing and south africa does allow for gay civil unions and gay marriages so it's not yeah. like they're ahead of the culture the, the, the country does but south africa takes tech money that you know that it's not like this is done in a vacuum they know that they're, they're kind of stinging the ring the, the the fingers that touch them you know that uh that they may be repelling future money and uh, kudos to them for you know telling what they believe uh sticking with a uh a you know two thousand year church principle and tradition and reason kudos now the only two foreign bishops, three foreign bishops, that I have seen come out saying, isn't this wonderful what the Church of England has done, is the Canadian primate, Linda Nichols, no surprise there, the former primate of the Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil, the Francisco de Assis Silva, or Francisco Silva de Assis, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Our apologies. He, he, he's <laughs> he's a bishop that. saying, isn't this wonderful what they've done? And the Brazilian Episcopal Church is very small, very liberal. Mm -hmm. And then the Bishop of the Southeastern Mexico, which stretches from Yucatan all the way down to uh, Chiapas. Uh, he was called to Mexico after serving the Canadian Church for 25 years. He's a Mexican national. And he's a lovely man, uh, Bishop uh, Martin. Um, they are the only people who I've seen speak out in support of Welby's work in support of his proposal so the, the the pendulum is swinging away from justin welby very very rapidly right now on the well, international level but this is where it gets interesting right after uh the church of england finished up the head of the acc anthony pogo made a call for a primates meeting hey let's get together and talk about this exciting thing the church of england just did and then you can do it where you are we'll let you know the process uh, i'm probably getting too far into the details but he certainly called for a primates meeting and crickets i hear nothing there's yeah nothing. that's we have not yeah. heard time or place as to when the bishops are to meet which is unusual now we can speculate what that means and it very well very well may mean that they for already seeing a block of people saying i'm not i'm not coming mm -hmm. i'm not involved well, i can't imagine a 40 person <laughs> zoom call either so <laughs> they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to meet somewhere and uh so but you know. but what it's saying is that the the way forward that Welby has offered, which is to have an Anglican Consultative Council driven process of a study commission and then reports and then have everybody sign off on the dotted line in the fullness of time. And by then he will have, con he will have uh, crowned King Charles III and he'll be able to retire having done the one big thing left for him to do as Archbishop and leave it to the next guy to solve the problem. The GAFCON Global South World is saying, no, 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 we're not playing that game anymore. In fact, uh, Justin Badirama yesterday released a video, a Lenten video, addressed to English conservatives saying, we have your back. Um, if the need arises for you to have alternative Episcopal oversight, we're really and willing and ready to do it. Um, that 
the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans were the guys 10, 15 years ago who weren't really ready to do that for the U.S. They hoped against hope it would be okay. And GAFCON stepped in. Now, Global South is where GAFCON was all those years ago. So it's interesting development. So that now Global South and GAFCON are essentially not, you can't really distinguish between them anymore. No, they have certainly have the same message, maybe different mythology. Mythology. Methodology, what, what, whatever. Sorry. Different way to do things. <laughs> it's been such a crazy week. Please forgive Kevin. His, his brain is not always on target here. Um, we have discussed this next topic uh, frequently, uh, all at least for the last two months. And the question is, is there a road where um, there could be a conservative bishop elected in the Episcopal Church? Uh, I kind of said a long time ago, maybe Mark Lawrence will be the last one. He had to go through the process twice. I said, ooh, this may be the last one they went in. And then there was a guy in uh, Texas who uh, uh, was moderate to conservative who got in, and maybe some more moderates around the uh, many dioceses. But we're seeing a stand down here in Florida and Central Florida uh, between what's happening to Charlie Holt and what happened to the bishop-elect uh, for Central Florida. And this is kind of the tale of two cities. Okay, this is the tale of two dioceses. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. First, what's the update on Charlie Holt? Charlie Holt, uh, a, essentially they're going to have, to, most likely they're going to have to do a redo. The standing committee has objected to the findings of the Court of Review. Uh, which basically cast doubt on the integrity of the diocese, not just the election. They said the election was held according to the rules just fine, but the diocesan integrity uh, was bad because they do not permit non-celibate gays and lesbians to be serve in the diocese. And so more than likely they'll have to have another election or it's a mess. The, the, and right now we saw a letter from the uh, it, I, I, all these new anagra uh, all these new uh, <laughs> alphabet names uh, yeah, by acronyms, yeah. black indigenous people of color B I P, back whatever it is there may be some other letters in there okay deputies from general convention who aren't supposed to do this sort of thing because their power only comes during general convention they're not little congressmen who have no you know it, independent you have lives. a four-day block that's it well they put out a letter saying that florida is mean to gays and lesbians and blacks and indigenous and people of color and this and that and therefore reject charlie holt's election so the process right now is where the request has gone out to either approve or reject Charlie Holt's election to the bishops and the standing committees. Um, it's been out there for a while and we've not had anything come back. We did hear from Central Florida. Central Florida uh, had its election and elected, and Central Florida is more conservative than the Diocese of Florida. Right. The Diocese of Florida has about a 10% liberal bloc. Uh, Diocese of Central Florida has a liberal parish, and the <laughs> rector there is a lovely, <laughs> and and the rector there is a lovely woman I know her very well, and uh, yeah. she's a very nice person, mm -hmm. um, Allison Haggerty, uh, great priest, and Central Florida's election they elected somebody who will basically maintain the status quo in Central Florida. Our, at our election, we were given three choices, somebody to basically fight the good fight nationally, somebody to pull back a bit and be more welcoming, or to uh, same old, same old. And we status elected quo. same old, same old, status right. quo. But and the can, status quo. Can I ask this question? Here's where I see hypocrisy. Your, di or your diocese, Central Florida, is more conservative than Florida. Your diocese doesn't have gay clergy. No. No. And so the Episcopal Church, the House of Bishops, is being very hypocritical by allowing your diocese to elect who you want and not Charlie Holt. And I'd really like to know why they're being hypocritical. Why are bishops who pave 
the floor of hell being hypocrites, George? Well, I think being a bishop means being a hypocrite in this day. But okay. no, you're right, Kevin. Central Florida, in a remarkably short period of time, got all the consents it needed. Yeah. So Justin Holcomb will be consecrated bishop in May or early June, while Charlie Holt's out in limbo. So your point, the more conservative diocese with the more conservative candidate, because Charlie Holt has been making all sorts of nice things about how he wants to reach out and this mm -hmm. and that. The people, the, the diocese where there's no black and white or shading gets kid glove treatments. Whereas the diocese that is more moderate is being hammered. What's going on? Because some of the speculation was there'll be no more conservative bishops. So if they're going to give Charlie Holt a problem, what are they going to do to Justin Holcomb? Well, we found they're going to do nothing. Why is this happening? Well, I called some people up in Florida, and it turns out that it's the current bishop who is the source of controversy, Sam Howard. Now, for those with long memory, Sam Howard was the one who fought Rowan Williams and drove out a clergy from his diocese, Deal. Neil Labar and company, 10, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and was just a bit of a jerk as it was described. I know Sam, I don't think he's a jerk, but he did rub some people the wrong way. He, well, in my memory, he rubbed them so long, so wrong in the way he did it, that people thought he was liberal. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. And he's not liberal. He's not liberal. Okay. Uh, Sam does not, Sam doesn't like uh, deacons. He mm -hmm. really has the thing against, especially women deacons. He doesn't really like women clergy. He won't move against them, but it's very uh, very few of them are called into the diocese from outside. Um, he uh, does not license gay clergy who are non-celibate. If you retire to that his diocese and you're a partnered gay man or woman, you will not be received into the diocese. You'll stay wherever you're from. And Sam, it seems, has alienated so many people that this is as much we're going to hit it, Sam, and poor Charlie is the collateral damage. When the first election was called, uh, was was done, and it was very close, and there were objections raised, and there was a redo order, Sam Howard decided to hire Charlie Holt on the staff of the diocese. You and I at the time said, ooh, that doesn't look quite good. Well, cringy, very cringy, cringy. Unfortunately, yeah. it wasn't received well. And it was received as Sam Howard is forcing his his boy onto us. So those who would normally just, you know, sit back and just let things take their course join that small group of activists saying, Hell no, we're not gonna let the bishop do this. So it seems that the adage all politics is local. In the Episcopal Church, in the Diocese of Florida, that's really what's going on. It's a fight between uh, Sam Howard, who is out of touch. And here's the thing. Some of the people who are, who are fighting Sam Howard are people he favored 10, 15 years ago. Kurt Dunkel, who had been his canon to the ordinary, who then went on to become dean of General Theological Seminary and dro drove that place into the ground, has come back to Florida. And... Kurt is one of the people leading the charge against Sam Howard, mm. which is, you know, extraordinary. Um, there's no, he doesn't seem to engender loyalty. Now, I like Sam. I think he's a nice guy. I believe his views are honestly held. He just hasn't managed to rub a good number of people in his diocese the wrong way. And now after 10 or 12 years of being bishop, they basically are saying, uh, can't wait to see the back of you, and we want all your buddies going too. All right. Well, let's see what happens in there. Keep uh, this situation in your prayers. Uh, I don't expect we would take the Episcopal Church completely with conservatives over the next dozen years, but I'm praying for that. Uh, let's go for. Oh, okay. I'm going to say this is the last Church of England story we're going to do today, but it's not. All right, the safeguarding report is out. I read through oh. it. It's it's a, a big report on uh, 
uh, how safeguarding has worked. Guess what? It didn't. Uh, in, in the Church of England. And it looks like safeguarding is one of the most dangerous things you could partake of in the, uh, the, the Church of England. And so we need to talk about this. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because we knew this was happening. Um, we knew that uh, safeguarding was a joke, that people have committed suicide because they were under investigation within uh, safeguarding and they were innocent. So let's just say what the report says, George, and, just, and try and jump out of the story as fast as possible. Well, the, this particular report looked at safeguarding at Lambeth Palace in the offices and staff of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And as bad as the Church of England has been on safeguarding, this report that came out uh, the end of February, finds, beginning of March, finds that the Archbishop of Canterbury's office is even worse that there is no accountability, there's no chain of command, there's no hierarchy, that bullying is rampant, that that uh, it's an utter fiasco. So that the, man, the, the bishop in charge, Justin Welby, who makes all these statements about safeguarding how important and vital it is, his own internal mechanisms are absent, are, are, are just dreadful. And this is not me just saying they're dreadful in my opinion. This was the finding of the report. Now, so how tone deaf Justin Welby is. Justin Welby has hired a new bishop to the bishop at Lambeth, uh, the former bishop of Manchester. And we talked about this fellow in the, about a few episodes ago about his love life, which was rather colorful. Well, this guy also had two formal rebukes on his record for having major safeguarding failures while being Bishop of Manchester. So here's a guy who has done, who basically is a two-time loser on safeguarding, uh, not informing, not following up, covering up, all this and that. He's now in charge of safeguarding at Lambeth Palace. You can't make... Martin Sewell, who is a member of General Synod and an advocate for uh, the abused in the Church of England tweeted uh, that uh, with the thought, I wonder why this isn't making more news. And then he answered his own question as saying that, well, nobody really expects any better from Justin Welby and Lambeth Palace. It's like Kevin, you or I talking about Muslims killing Christians in Nigeria or corruption in India. It's the same old, same old. Yeah. yeah. And that is such a shame. And so now another group of people are calling for Justin Welby to step down, this time over his overseeing a safeguarding process in his own backyard that is unfit for purpose. Oh, good. Oh, that story's over. We're done. Okay, all done. Don't want to talk about any... Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, George. Oh, boy. Here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, get the volume up here. And I don't know if the volume translates into uh, um, our browser thing here at all, but uh, this wonderful drag queen was invited to perform and conduct uh, his slash her routine at a church. Not in this country <laughs> yet, <laughs> but in the UK, George. And I thought, hey... So why don't we just talk about this? On March 2nd, St. James in Piccadilly, and Piccadilly is a very nice part of London, a mm -hmm. very uh, swanky area. So the uh, vicar or rector is Lucy Winkett, who's one of these women priests who's always on the BBC's Thought for a Moment. And uh, uh, is That's all uh, she's got. Well, she's a member of the Church of England's Mean Girls Club. Uh, she's only had well, one thought a moment. What's happened is that now that LLF has come forward, Mm -hmm. People are interpreting in their own way. Now, this is in the Diocese of London. And they can now have uh, drag queen nights for children at St. James in Piccadilly, where they can have dra entertainers, transgender entertainers, as if this were some sort of louche nightclub in Soho or Montmartre. Um, they're having this at the, ch at the church as... At because the doors were opened by the LLF. And 
the other things we're seeing, uh, some of our correspondents in England are saying that uh, they're noticing all of a sudden these young clergy who are deacons or who are ordinands in the process are now putting on Twitter in their status that they're married to a person of the same gender with pictures of their weddings and everything. And that they basically have been keeping this secret or maybe only the people, you know, they hide this from us peasants so we don't get excited. But now they feel totally comfortable in proclaiming that they are living lives that are not in conformity with the canons of the Church of England. Now, to have a drag queen entertain at a church of England with children present, you basically need to do safeguarding procedures because we've had a lot of things in the United States where these drag performers, a good number of them, have been found to be uh, convicted child sexual offenders, child predators, yeah, I, sexual child offenders. Predators. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and there are canonical things that you cannot turn a church into a nightclub like mm -hmm. this. But will well, anything happen? Uh, I've written to the Diocese of London. I've not gotten an answer. But uh, it, it, here in America, in the Episcopal Church, certainly in the ACNA, a person who is um, teaching the children or who is a daycare provider or you know uh, to Sunday school children has to pass a background check right yes yes okay this drag queen and many of the other ones that are performing in churches would not pass a background check because many and so so many many of them have what we'd call rap sheet uh that would disqualify them from being uh teachers or, or a person to perform in front of children and uh you know what would safeguarding say about that no, you, uh, I don't think we should. I really would rather we didn't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. This is, at the end of the day, how does this glorify God? How do we entertain this in, in our worship setting? This is this is where we worship. This is where we have our Eucharist. This is where we preach and we, we say the Gospels. And this is where we have our great liturgies and we've desiccated it this church needs to be cleaned i i, I might i might don't want to go on a rant yes i do well st james piccadilly is both desiccated as you say it's dried up the spirit is absent and it's been desecrated it, things that are ungodly have been practiced in its uh, sanctuary area but the expectation that people would have restraint once the gates were opened on the mm -hmm. gay issue. In the United States, we saw this was utter nonsense. But in the Church of England, the bishops have been saying, oh, well, we'll do this in an ordered, measurely fashion. We're not even a month out from LLF. We've got drag shows. We've got deacons who are in the ordination, who are waiting to be made priests, boasting of their fabulous wedding with their, their husband or their wife or this or that, who are the same gender or sex. There is no holding back this sin, this brokenness, this. There's no holding bad back, taste. George, be, because well, it's not just bad taste. They've gone the ultimate. That there, we, I want to put it on screen. That's not the ultimate. The ultimate is when they cancel and fire the conservatives. So there's no recourse. There's nobody to, to hold them accountable. Uh, therefore, you as lay people, and you're out there. I, there's uh, more than half of this audience is a layperson. Many of you from the Church of England. You're all that's left to to well, hold. That's more, you, but see, Kevin, you that's know. you're right. That's more than enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the church is not the clergy. It's not the institution. It's not the the smells and bells. The church is that gathered community of people. Look at what the mm -hmm. articles of religion say. Mm -hmm. uh, First order where it's, laity, uh, and. and that's what we taught in our catechism in the Episcopal Church. The first order of ministry is the lay people. Um, but God, uh, God's in charge. And we shouldn't despair. We really shouldn't because we're allowing, if you will, Satan to act out all of its evil stuff now so that we can, when we begin the good cleanup, there's not going to be any doubt uh, who are the goats and who are the sheep. All right. Hey, let's just let's just end this episode with a, a light story out of Uganda. Not very controversial. 
you know, something anybody be helpful to talk about. Uh, Uganda is doing an update with the gay laws, and uh, um, somehow the church is going to make the news in this, George. Oh, yeah. Uh, I see. I foresee a PR disaster in the making, mm-hmm. but I don't think at this point that anything can shock anybody. Not, pe- many of our viewers will remember a number of years ago, the Ugandan parliament adopted a law that criminalized homosexuality, which was already criminalized. But they added a new proviso that groups or uh, social media sites that advocate for for young people to explore their sexual identity, uh, basically all the woke transgender nonsense that we have in the United States, those will be criminalized in Uganda. And the Church of Uganda says, yes, we agree, because we believe that this contagion from the West of social media convincing people, convincing vulnerable young people, vulnerable adults that God didn't make them male or female, he made them binary, or so I just saw some statistic where some 20% of the teens 23%, in England yeah. identify as uh, homosexual or lesbian, um, when the st- normal statistical mean is like 3 or 4% because they have been i don't want to say brainwashed because that's not no, a real term they've been groomed groomed they've it's been groomed been, they've yes. been taught that this is ex- taught that this is right this is good yeah. acceptable mm-hmm. and the ugandan ch- church doesn't want that to spread to uganda well what's going to happen this will pass parliament in uganda it the first time around it passed parliament with a mass majority but it was tossed out by the supreme court because there wasn't a quorum that day when the vote was taken so it was thrown out on a technicality It'll pass this time. It'll be signed into law by the president. And then we will see Justin Welby and other Jane Ozan and other people saying, oh, it's hate the gays time. We're trying to criminalize gay people. We're trying to all this and that. When the church, you know, the motives of the man proposing the uh, law, I don't know what they are. He could be a, an unpleasant person with evil thoughts. But for the, the, the Church of Uganda's understanding, it is that we need to stand up against the corrupting influences from the West. And just like we in the United States, we don't have cigarette ads on TV anymore so that young people aren't uh, persuaded that smoking is cool. The same way of thinking the Church of Uganda is, is advocating, saying we don't want these things on our social media that can be reached by Ugandan children to think that gender bending is cool or mm-hmm. being by non-binary is cool. And that's one of the big things we have with our adolescent kids. They are going through their identity crisis. When in the 80s you went through an identity crisis, you normally tended for anorexia, if you had gender dysphoria uh, or some other uh, um, uh, cutting or hurting yourself. Here, there's now a million choices of what you can do when you go through uh, the, the adolescent, I don't know who I am. And the, the last choice they give you is to seek out God in this. The last choice to see it, well, go talk to your priest. I bet he could help you out. Or talk to a, a Christian friend. That's the, that's the last choice society, no, society doesn't want to give you that choice. Forgive me for saying last choice. But so we, we have arrived now where we introduce kindergartners to uh, gender theory and we tell them you were born with one set of identical markers of your biology, your gender could be anywhere in between or something completely new that we haven't discovered yet. And that, George, is the destruction of society. It's one thing for Satan to convince you that he does not exist. When he convinces you that you are not your biological sex, he has won because he's convinced you that you may be willing to cut off what you don't need in order to become somebody else. And I can't, there are a few things more evil, uh, but I just can't think of them off the top of my head. I'll list that as number one. And we, we now have a society, it's gonna take 20 years to figure out um, that this was wrong, oh, oops, us. Uh, I don't know why we're listening to the liberals on this. They were just wrong once. But George, this is so bad. I've talked about before. There is a Reddit forum for people ty- trying to detrans 
uh, to take the surgery that has completely destroyed their bodies. And let's see what the how many people they're up to now. Um, when I brought it on to you guys before, the mar there were forty thousand. There's now sixty-five thousand kids going to this Reddit forum looking for help. They said I was lied to. I went to the surgeon, uh, the gender surgeon, and he only gave me an hour of counseling before I signed off on on me taking off my breast and having uh, my forearm detached to my my vagina. And you're just like, George, how evil are we as a society? I, what, what could be worse? Okay, what, the, the one society worse than us, Aztecs. But we're, we're, we're in a tough competition, George. Ah, uh, George, that's my rant. I'm sorry. I went it's on. It's not a rant, Kevin. It's the truth. You're that's speaking the... the truth from your heart because <sighs> you and I know um, that, you know, Satan is a lion that prowls around and seeks to destroy us. And he appears in many guises, in many forms. And, you know, the, the temptations and the problems of our generation are not the problem of today's generation. And we've been caught, you and I, our generation have been caught blind to the forces that are attacking our own children. But we just need to be patient and trust that God is in charge. That of all think, of this pain and suffering, Christ will be honored and glorified. My biggest struggle in all this is the church is not there. This evil was designed for the church to respond to, not to succumb to. That's... It just hurts so but the, much. But yeah. the institution is not there. But the church, meaning the people of God, are there and have been there. Individuals speaking to individuals. That's the true church, Kevin. It's not uh, what uh, Michael Curry releases on the internet. Who? On, on the, Michael Curry or Michael whatnot. Michael Curry. I've the, tr the, tr the, tr the true church is, is a... Is a I was in prison this past week. Uh, did I tell you this? Again? No. no. You make parole? No, I, no. no. I, 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 I uh, was invited uh, to uh, the Sumter Correctional Institute. Uh, oh, you, you were down at my side of the country, yeah. Yeah, and I spent the uh, day there meeting the new assistant warden, the new chaplain, and uh, when COVID came, all the volunteer stuff died, and now they're slowly restarting it. And I'm part of this Governor DeSantis initiative of, of private-public partnerships to help inmates reform and turn their lives around. And I was uh, there, and the day was on fatherhood. And uh, I was in a gym with four or 500 inmates, about a dozen guards, the chaplain and me. We saw a movie, we had some speakers, then we broke into small groups. and. The theme that I heard with the dozen, two dozen, or 18 people in my little circle were, you know, I was a gangbanger in Miami. I was raised by my grandmother. I had no male influences, and now I'm in this place till I die. And if I'd only had a father and hadn't sought out the father who was a 17-year-old and I was 12-year-old who had gave me a gun and taught me how to hold up liquor stores. Fatherhood, the, the point of the 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 day was to instill the need for fatherhood and to restore the role of men in the lives of young men. And this is what I hear, and this is the church at work. Whether, and th this is truly the church at work. In other words, my job when I go into prison isn't to make little Episcopalians. I'd probably have to go to the white collar prison over in Coleman, Florida to meet the white Episcopalians. Uh, but, you know, this is a prison, uh, long term inmates, N25 life sentences. Many are not going to get out. And it's not to turn them, make them religious, but to bring them the faith of Jesus Christ. And the church is one person to another because I may influence or convert one or two people a year, but that one fellow I convert may turn hundreds in his lifetime uh, around into the good news of Jesus Christ. So yes, I agree with you. I'm being pedantic, I apologize. I agree no, with no. you that the institutional no. church as letting down the side but the church it's, has the it's joined the wrong the side of, george yeah but the church has the members of the body of christ mm -hmm. be they lay or ordained they're wonderful clergy they're wonderful bishops they're wonderful lay people they're miserable bishops they're miserable clergy and they're rotten human beings lay people mm -hmm. 
But the church is not what you wear on the outside. It's where you are on the inside in your faith relationship with Jesus Christ. If you need counseling and you want to have your own revival um, and talk to somebody, you've been, a, first of all, you made it to the end of the program. You're probably pretty desperate. If you're a person, <laughs> yeah, Can no, I, just, I just want just, go ahead, yeah, finish up. I just want to share one little anecdote and, and that one of the people I met a number of years ago with the Kairos Prison Ministry, which is the weekend groups, and I've been involved in that for a number of years before COVID came. Uh, this was, a, as a young man, this boy, when he was 17, he shot and killed a Florida State trooper. He was on a crime spree, stole a car, robbed a liquor store, was chased by the police, uh, got out into the highway, and was chased by the state troopers, and he shot out of his window, and he killed a state trooper. And he was convicted, given the death penalty, but and this went to the Supreme Court, uh, but they said, because you're 17, you're a minor, you're not going to be executed. So passed back to the governor, who basically said life in prison without parole. This happened in 1957. So this guy has been in prison, what, 65 years. Now, if anybody has a reason to be despondent or think about a wasted life or, or somebody, and the state of Florida will never parole this man. I'm sorry if you kill a cop, if you kill a state trooper, you're not getting out except in a box. And even then you don't get out, you get buried inside the prison grounds. This man, when he was in his 20s and early 30s, had a conversion experience. And whenever I meet him in prison, he comes up, he gives me a hug, and he says, isn't this a wonderful day in the Lord? Um, he has spent the last 40, 50 years working with young men who come into the prison, and he tries to share with them the good news of Christ so they don't wind up like him. He made a free will choice to steal a car, rob a liquor store, and shoot a state trooper and kill him. And he must suffer the consequences for that free will choice. But the Lord, out of that tra tragedy, out of that nihilistic destructive behavior, has used him to help bring people salvation. And so as he looks on his life, he said, yes, I would have done things differently but I feel that the Lord has been my side mate all these years and behind the walls in Florida. I, I, I make that point because that man is the church and he is fighting in his little corner of Sumter County where you are, Kevin, uh, the good fight. And we shouldn't give in just because that the news is bad and the schools are bad and our friends and family may do, say and so, do stupid things. Because God is still God. Yeah. Let the drama be the drama. Let the Lord be the Lord. Well, Kevin, after yeah. the, after that sermon, we now say the Nicene Creed. Uh, that's that's right. where we are in the service. <laughs> I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 792 of Anglican Unscripted.